tonight I wanted to share with you uh, a little bit on a, on a technology I've been doing quite a bit of research on. I'm not an academic, um, but I've, I'm an engineer. I've been you know, coding for 25 years or something and have developed an interest in cryptography the last few years. Um, and so this topic of order revealing encryption has really piqued my interest and I wanted to share with you some of the things that I've, I've discovered. Um, so let's start. Uh, those of you that are probably in the industry have probably heard of the OAIC, which is the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner. Uh, and they release reports every quarter or so. If you work in security, you've probably seen this stuff uh, a million times before, but I wanted to share with you some of their uh, data. So last year they, re they, released, uh, they released a report every quarter, actually. Um, and in Q3 last year they had 245 data breaches. That's reportable data, free data breaches or notifiable data breaches. I can only imagine how many more there were that occurred that weren't actually reported. Um, hopefully people are doing the right thing, but you never know. Uh, of those, 62% were attributed to malicious attacks, so that's people actually attacking you. The second most uh, prevalent reason was human error, which is also probably hardly surprising. Um, but what, was, what I found particularly alarming was that 42% contained financial information, which is probably not a surprise, um, and 27% contained health information. So I work in uh, the health tech industry, and so this is of particular relevance to me personally in my current role. Um, but I think as even just as, a, as an individual citizen, knowing that my health information, my private personal health information could be getting into the wrong hands is, is pretty alarming. Um, another, another fairly famous uh, example was uh, the, the data leak from Anthem a few years back now. Um, I, there were so many examples to choose from, but I, I chose this one because of the particularly high number of records that were <laughs> leaked, uh, something like 80 million records were exfiltrated in that attack. Uh, and while the initial attack vector was through, I think, phishing, um, it was actually because of the compromising or, or, or the DB uh, server credentials that were leaked and they were able to get uh, all those 80 million records. So a lot of these attacks are very multifaceted. Um, it's not just one thing that leads to the leak of the data. It's often long-term hacks with lots and lots of different points in the process. And these, these um, groups or individuals are often very, very motivated, so they spend a lot of time doing it. But ultimately, the data is in the database. So it's the database that, we, that I'm focusing on tonight and where it's a, it's a key part in, in any sensible uh, security uh, plan. So let's think about the Anthem case. The Anthem case uh, was a database that was leaked, the 80 million records with containing health information. And they, uh, they said they had an encrypted database. And we often say in, in, in this space, well, it's encrypted at rest, so it must be safe, right? Well, sure, yeah, that makes sense at some level. But let's, let's think about that for a second. So this is an example of, of what you might call transparent data encryption. And most of the major <coughs> database vendors support this, Oracle, Microsoft, and the open source stuff with Postgres and MySQL. Um, what's actually happening when we're talking about transpa transparent data encryption is we're encrypting the underlying file system. So it's a, a similar approach uh, using AES XTS, a similar approach to say file vault on your Mac. It's encrypting the actual data underneath. But the, the problem is that the key lives on the same machine that the encryption is taking place on. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is that when that data is decrypted and loaded, it's being, it's being kept in memory in plain text. So anyone that's actually getting access to the database in a live situation is still accessing the data directly. It's not actually encrypted. And so that means that any clients that are connected can directly read the plain text. Encryption doesn't mean anything to them. Database dumps, now they might be encrypted later, but there's a period of time in the middle there where they're in plain text. And even stuff like replication. Replication usually occurs outside of uh, in transparent data encryption as well. Sometimes it might be transported in encrypted form, but there's always a, a point in the middle there where it needs to go from plain text to ciphertext, and that, that point in the middle is, is an attack vector. So that's, that's something to be aware of. When you, when you hear about people talking about uh, encryption at rest, it's not necessarily selling the whole picture. I think sometimes there's this perception that uh, we're solving lots of problems just by encrypting things. Um, so the key is, excuse the pun, the trust model. Who owns the keys? And when we, we work with cloud providers, we're inherently giving them a lot of trust with our data. Um, think of the example where you invite somebody into your house, you maybe a cleaner or somebody looking after your cats while you're away. You give them a key. You're, you're trusting that person, and you hope that they're going to do the right thing by you, not steal your stuff or 
God knows what in your house. And we should really be thinking the same way about cloud providers. We're putting a lot of trust in those organizations with our data. Um, and we need to think about A, who those people are, but also how we can maybe reduce the amount of trust we need to give them. Um, so this is what a, a typical model might look like. Um, so I'm a client, and then, now this could be an individual person or it could be some other application running somewhere. And we might send some data to uh, the, the, the cloud. Let's say, for argument's sake, it's Amazon Relational Data Service. Um, we send it to them in plain text. Now, admittedly, there's an SSL tunnel, so it is encrypted. But then it's decrypted and then re-encrypted by keys that they control and then stored somewhere in the database, probably using transparent data encryption. Um, so that key is controlled by them. So bear in mind. What if we were to flip that around? What if we were to say, I don't want our, my cloud provider to ever see plain text information. I only ever want them to see encrypted data. In, in other words, I don't want them to see anything. Um, so to do that, I could control the key. I could control the key as a client, or I could have it installed in my local application, or whatever the case may be. But the cloud provider never sees it. So I encrypt it first, and then send the ciphertext across the wire. So how might we achieve that? Well, one, one common approach is to simply encrypt the data first, and then say using something like this, which is a, an SQL statement to insert the data, I could insert into the user's table name and email. And rather than inserting the actual data, I could insert the ciphertext, the encrypted version of the data. So then our table might look something like this. But then, so my, my sensitive data, name, email, age, is all encrypted. But then I have to have some reference. I have to know how I'm going to be able to, to, to get the right ciphertext to be able to, encrypt, to decrypt it later when I need to use it. So in this case, I've used an identifier. Now, hopefully, that's uh, not personally identifying information. Sometimes it can be inadvertently. But I need to have a record there to, to be able to tie it to. So in order to get that data back, I might say select name from users where ID equals one, and then I'm going to get a ciphertext back from my client, and then I can decrypt that information. OK, cool. So that's, that actually is a reasonably good solution, uh, and a lot of people do that. There's a few libraries um, uh, around that do that kind of thing. Um, I see there's a few Elixir folks here. The Cloak library does that. Um, but what if I wanted to do this? I wanted to select name from users where email equals blah. So I might say, well, the, site, the email is encrypted in ciphertext. It's a ciphertext form. It's stored in the database. So why don't I encrypt email first and then do a lockup in the database for that ciphertext? It doesn't quite work that way. So if I encrypt, say, using AES, which is the, the kind of universal standard for symmetric encryption, um, I encrypt my email address. I'm happy to share that, by the way, just in case you're wondering. Um, that'll give me a ciphertext. If I encrypt it again, I'll actually get a different ciphertext. Now, that's the encryption of, of my email address, but it's actually uh, using a different, what's called initialization vector, so it's going to give me a different ciphertext. And again, will give me another one again. So if I'm storing one of those in the database, and I want to encrypt my query, and then try to do a string comparison between those queries, it won't work, because the, the database doesn't know that they are the two, two the same things. And that's because AES is what's known as chosen plain text secure. So that means the same plain text encrypted multiple times will never give the same ciphertext. OK, so let's say we don't care about that. Let's say we, we decide to reduce our security assumption and we use something like HMAC. So this is like if, you've, if you're an engineer, you've probably come across MD5 which, or SHA, which is like the old hashing techniques. HMAC is just a keyed version of that. So it takes the key and gives you a, um, a unique version of the hash for that key. But every time I encrypt, uh, my email address, I'm going to get the same ciphertext. So I'm now ignoring that, that idea of chosen plain text security, uh, so I get the same result. Now that's actually really helpful in this situation, because when I encrypt my query, I can now compare it to the records in the database, and I can, I can load the relevant record. Great. But remember that it's deterministic, and it's not CPA secure, chosen plain text attack secure. So if you're not a cryptographer, you might not have come across this, so I just want to run you through it very quickly. Um, let's imagine that an attacker, and that attacker actually has access to my database. They can't see any of the data because it's encrypted, but they can see the ciphertext as I'm inserting them. And so then what they can do is they can insert, uh, ask the service, ask my database to please encrypt this email address. The database will encrypt it, and then because I've, because I've compromised the database, I can now see the ciphertext as well. So now, as a consequence, I can see the plain text, and I know what the encryption of that plain text is. 
So now every time I see that ciphertext somewhere in the database, I know that that's, I know what plain text in, it encrypts. So I can just pick a whole bunch of common email addresses. I can pick, um, I don't know, prime minister's email address and I can look for that, that email address in the database. Uh, I'm not going to see the original email, but I know what the encryption of that, that email is and so I know that that, that that ciphertext will be prime minister's email address. So basically it's, uh, it's useless at that point. So we really want to try and maintain chosen plain text attack security if we can, or CPA secure. And even ignoring that, you can forget about queries such as this. So if I wanted to select the name from users where age is more than 21, so that's a, uh, in, an inequality, um, or I wanted to sum up some data and get an average, or anything like ordering, none of these queries is going to work when I'm encrypting the data using AES or even a reduced security assumption like HMAC. So we're kind of screwed at that point, right? Maybe not. So this is where fully homomorphic encryption comes in. And there's lots of people that are doing some research on, on FHE. It's a very hot space in crypto land at the moment. Um, it's uh, kind of the holy grail, I suppose, a lot, of, a lot of researchers will say, but we sort of have a long way to go. But let me introduce you to, to the concept first. So let's imagine that we've got a database, cloud database here in red. I'm using red to indicate stuff that's not, secu not secure. Um, and let's say Alice and Bob want to insert some data into that uh, database and they're going to put their income and their age into, into the database. And in this database, we just want to calculate average salary. And actually, the cloud provider only wants to know the average salary, but they've got to keep all the original data in order to calculate it. I mean, there are, there are other techniques that you can use to, to, to mitigate that, but essentially, that's, that's uh, what we're doing in this example. So uh, what fully homomorphic encryption will do is encrypt the data that, that Alice and Bob uh, want to send to the cloud provider first, so they're going to en encrypt it using this fully homomorphic, fully homomorphic encryption scheme with a public key that's going to get stored in the database in ciphertext form. So the cloud provider cannot see what that data is. In, in this example, I'm keeping name plain text just so it's easy for, for you to read, but salary is encrypted, so XXXYYY. We don't know what that is. But then what FHE can do is it can do operations on that encrypted data it has no idea what the encrypted data is, but it can add it up, and the result will also be encrypted, but it will be the encryption of the sum of those first two things. You with me? Yeah. Okay. So then what can happen is John, who, say, wants to see the average, can use his private key to just get the result of that, that uh, summation. So John is trusted in this model. The cloud database is not. So any data that store is, is stored in that database is encrypted. So you can think of this, we talk about offline encryption or, or encryption at rest. This is one way to think about encryption in an online way. So now you've got three ways to think about encryption. Encryption in transit, encryption at rest, and online encryption. And online encryption is kind of where, where the thing's at, right? So if you think about um, FHE or fully homomorphic encryption and compare it to a, a traditional plain text operation, I'm sure you're all familiar with this idea, adding 100 to 200 equals 300, cool. And we can do the same thing in FHE world. So we have the ciphertext which represents the encryption of 100, the ciphertext which represents the encryption of 200, add them together under an FHE scheme, and we get another ciphertext which we know because we've seen the plain text that it's the representation of the encryption of 300. But anyone working on that data doesn't actually know what the numbers are. So that's really, really powerful. Uh, and you can do the idea of fully homomorphic encryption, we'll talk about partial in a moment, is that Effectively, it should be able to support all of the kind of typical operations or at least a large set of operations. So you can do it with multiplication, division, or even comparison. Comparison's very, very useful. Um, so generally speaking, if you want to sort of think about the maths of it, the function which uh, takes the fully homomorphic encryption of A and of B is equivalent, not equal, but equivalent to the fully homomorphic uh, encryption of the function of the two plain texts. So think about it in those terms. Anyway, don't have to worry about that too much. So there are some examples out in the wild. So there's, there's quite a lot of research and papers um, publicly available. And there's quite a lot of uh, public domain or open source libraries uh, that you can check out. Uh, sort of the first one that came onto the scene was HELib. Um, I think that was an effort of um, IBM. And that was introduced in 2013. Palisade, which is sort of a, 
uh, handles lots and lots of different kinds of encryption and, and a few different variants on homomorphic encryption. That came from DARPA. Um, so I don't know how much you trust it, but you know. Um, TFHE is another good one. And then uh, a couple of guys that, that um, they made a company called New Cipher. It was all sort of, remember two years ago when ICOs were all a rage, everybody was investing in ICOs? These guys had an, had a, an ICO uh, called New Cipher and they developed a library called New FHE, which is basically TFHE uh, with graphics cards. So it's to, to get it to go really fast using the CUDA acceleration. However, even with lots and lots of graphics cards, the, uh, the CUDA uh, acceleration to, to do a one process one bit uh, in FHE world uh, takes 0.13 milliseconds. So that is, if you think about all the, all the gates required to make an adder, logical adder for 32 bits, it's going to take 200 milliseconds to add two 32-bit numbers together. 200 milliseconds in, in computing land is forever. So that means that 1,032 bit adding 32 bit sorry adding 1,032 bit integers is going to take about three minutes, which on any typical system in plain text you can't you can't even time it almost it's you know instantaneous uh, a few hundred milliseconds a few, sorry a few hundred microseconds at most. Uh, so that's not practical not yet anyway. So if people say they're doing fully homomorphic encryption, challenge them because they're probably not. They might be doing partial homomorphic encryption. And so there is one example of, of a partial homomorphic encryption library which is actually reasonably performant. Um, and that is the Palier edition. Uh, has anyone heard of this before, Palier edition? No. Uh, it's actually quite well supported. There's some open source libraries in C and Java and I did actually uh, used one in Ruby. Um, and what Palier does is it, it basically looks at the uh, FHE model and says, we're only going to do one operation. We're just going to do add. And so add is, is pretty useful. It doesn't obviously cover that many use cases, but add, add is useful. So we can take, say, the Palier encryption of 2, add it to the Palier encryption of 3, and then we get the encryption of 2 plus 3. So then we can work on all the ciphertext. So that's actually really cool. Uh, and the performance is significantly better. Um, but you look at it in terms of the numbers that you're adding, it does get worse the bigger the number, so the more bytes it has to process. So adding 1 to 1, takes 49 microseconds, adding 1 to a million takes 118 microseconds. So you compare that to the arithmetic, simple arithmetic plain text add, uh, it's about 3,500 times slower. But that's actually still 2,000 times faster than New Cipher's implementation. So it's sort of somewhere in the middle. It's actually verging on practical at that point, depending on how you're using it. And there's some research that a few people are doing on electronic voting systems and those sorts of things in terms of uh, using uh, Palier uh, cryptography. So just for reference, that's, this was done on my fairly fast Linux machine that I used to edit videos. So it's got plenty of grunt and it's still taking that long. So it gives you uh, a bit of a sense of it. It's probably not practical for like embedded devices and things like that yet. So order preserving encryption is sort of the next thing I want to introduce you to. Order preserving encryption has been around for quite a while and it's, it's sort, of, sort of an interesting topic. It's not really actively being pursued at the moment for reasons which I'll get into. Um, but es essentially it defines the comparison operator for ciphertext encrypted under the scheme. So it's usually a symmetric key. Um, and that means we now have a function like this. So the comparison function where we take ciphertext A and ciphertext B and like any comparator that you might have seen if you're a coder, uh, it returns minus one if A is less than B, zero if they're equal, and B if, uh, sorry, and one if B is less than A. So it's just that, that three, three set, three value set. Um, this is different to a partial homomorphic encryption scheme though, even though it's implementing the comparison operator. Can anyone tell me why? Anyone got any ideas why that's the case? Comparison would be more like a war or an exploit type of thing? Um, no, not necessarily. No. So what is the difference? Why is Palier not a sorry, a partially homomorphic encryption scheme? See how much everyone's been paying attention. So basically, if it was fully homomorphic, oops, it would look like that. So rather than getting a plain text value, so with, with order, order preserving, um, we would get a plain text result. So we get an indicator of whether those two things are equal, less than, or greater than. Uh, and so we actually now know something about the plain text, even though we're only working on ciphertext. Whereas if it was a fully homomorphic or partially homomorphic encryption scheme, we don't even know that. We just get another ciphertext, which would be the encryption of 
the indicator showing less than, greater than, or equal to. We still don't know anything about it. So this is actually not uh, homomorphic encryption, although it is related. It's a similar sort of idea. So OP8, this is like a dramatic simplification of how it works, by the way, but you can think of it as, as something like this. So when I encode 100, I get a ciphertext, and then I encode 200, and then this is lexicographically more than this, and encoding 300, and that's lexicographic more than that. So, that. so the ciphertexts stay in the same order that the plain texts were in. And that's actually really useful for a lot of things. For example, I could stick it in a tree, uh, like a binary search tree, and put it in a database, and I can now do range queries on stuff. And range queries open up all sorts of interesting possibilities. It allows me to do um, that one of the queries I mentioned earlier, where I can say, show me everybody in the, in the database where age is more than x. Or I can do, it actually opens up things like free text search, because I can, I can do comparisons of, of stems and stuff like that. Uh, so it's actually really, really powerful. But uh, there's a problem, big problem, as it turns out. So there was a paper back from 2015, and, and there's a few videos on YouTube that, that go into this in a bit of detail. Naveed et al. showed that OPE, or auto-preserving encryption, is, is uh, susceptible to what they call inference attacks. So what that means is the, the distribution of the plaintext data is very, very closely correlated to the distribution of the ciphertext data. Now, why would that be a problem? So let's imagine that this is the encryption of all uh, words in English. So we know, uh, we know, because we know what English is, that the word the is the most prevalent word. So we know that whatever, whatever ciphertext is the most prevalent ciphertext is probably the word the. And it actually works all the way back. And what Naveed et al showed is that up to 95% of the data can be recovered just through this idea of an inference attack. And actually, this is not a new technique. This is how um, the team at Fletchley Park cracked the Enigma team. It's Enigma code. It's exactly the same uh, concept. It's just using statistical information to, to, to decipher it. And so this is one of the reasons why AES uses that idea of chosen plain text security. So OPE is kind of not that great. Maybe you'd argue it's a little bit better than not encrypting it at all. Probably is, but it's, don't think of it as a silver bullet. So auto-revealing encryption. We get to the, to the meaty part of the talk. So what is auto-revealing encryption? So I, I study a particular, I've been studying a particular paper. It's like my favorite paper the last few years. Uh, it's, it's available um, on uh, one of the author's uh, websites. So these two guys from Stanford, Wu et al. Uh, in 2016, developed an idea of block auto-revealing encryption. And so what makes their uh, approach quite interesting is that it's, it, when you encrypt a plain text, it actually splits the plain text into two, what they call the left and right ciphertexts. And so if you only keep the right ciphertexts, you can keep them in a database, they're actually what you, would, what you would call semantically secure. So remember that chosen plain text attack secure that we were talking about before? This is um, resilient or resistant to chosen plain text attacks. It's also resistant to chosen ciphertext attacks, which makes it effectively as secure as proper full AES, which is really, really interesting. However, um, it does implement a function, a compare function, and, and actually uh, there's two sort of variants of it. You can have a, a simple compare, which zero is uh, more than or equal to, oh sorry, zero is less than and one is more than or equal to, so that's useful, but there's also a variant which requires more, more storage space to do it where you can have all three, minus one, zero, and one. Implements that compare operator. Uh, and what it does, if you notice here, what's interesting is that this is not comparing A and B. This is comparing the left ciphertext of A and the right ciphertext of B. So that means we can keep all of our right ciphertexts in the database, and while they're in the database, even loaded into RAM, so that's online encryption, they are still semantically secure. So nobody can learn anything about those ciphertexts while they're in the database, even live. Only at the point of querying do we now generate the, the ORE encryption of our query, and we use the left red ciphertext here to compare to the right ciphertexts in the database, and now I can get a result. So let's go. So there wouldn't be any need to <coughs> maintain the database at the left side at the client end? No, no. So that's the, that's the beauty of it. So if I wanted to, let's go through this example. It might make it yeah. clearer. So if you've got, say, a, a database here containing the, the right encryptions of the numbers 1, 3, 4, and so on, and I wanted to uh, do this query where x is more than or equal to 4, what I would do is I would uh, take the left encryption of 4, and then I would send that, and I would compare it to each of these. And so I now can say, well, 
This is more than equal to four, so this is four, and then all of these results will be returned. So you compute as needed on the client. Correct, yeah. So you don't actually need to store uh, the left ciphertext. You only need to generate the left ciphertext while you're doing the query. So the, the, you can think of it as the, the threat window is dramatically decreased. Yes, there's still an opportunity for some data leakage, but you're now only uh, getting that opportunity as a, as a would-be attacker when the query is being done. And even then, I'll skip over insert for a moment, even then the leakage is only such that the attacker can find the first block that differs between two ciphertexts. So a block can, is usually 8 bytes, but you can configure it when you get up to 12 or 16 bytes. Um, I should also mention that insertion is also very similar. So all you need to do to insert something is, say we wanted to insert 11 to our database, you can take the left and right encryptions of 11, use the left to compare where it needs to go in your list, and then you insert the right. And so I'm using a very simple list example here, but that could also be a tree. So then you can get some really, really fast um, lookups. So let's have a look at the performance. I think this is quite interesting. It's certainly significantly better than some of the other schemes we've looked at. Um, so to encrypt, uh, let's say block size of eight, that's sort of the one I've been using in, in my experiments, uh, it takes about 54 microseconds, which is not bad. Um, and then the compare takes about 0.63 microseconds, which is actually not too far off what you would get in a traditional plain text compare. However, the problem is that it takes up a lot of space. So we're talking about a 30, if it's block size of eight, we're talking about a 32 bit uh, integer, so that's four bytes, now it takes up 224 bytes. That's, in, that's the, the left and the right combined, and the rights are much, much bigger than the left. So you end up with databases which are an order of magnitude bigger than you might otherwise have gotten. So you're going from four bytes to an integer to, I think it's about 184 bytes for the right ciphertext in that scheme. Um, but hey, storage is cheap, right? And what price do we put on our security? So interesting. Um, certainly the authors of the paper would, would have you believe that the ciphertext size is probably not a major concern uh, and especially uh, you know, backed up with the security advantages that you get from it. So that's interesting. So we can go through some pros and cons of the scheme. So right ciphertexts are semantically secure, like I said, so ci chosen plain text attack and chosen ciphertext attack secure. Uh, encryption's pretty fast. Um, it's got very fast comparison. It's based on existing primitives, which I think is really interesting. A lot of the other fully homomorphic encryption schemes are using really new uh, encryption techniques, whereas this just uses AES and SHA, which are out in the wild for years, been proven, they've got NIST standards and, and all the rest of it. So it actually is a, a really big advantage in that regard. And unlike OPE, order preserving encryption, order revealing encryption is resistant to inference attacks, so like the uh, statistical analysis stuff we talked about before. Some of the downsides, very large ciphertexts, um, so to put that in perspective, a thousand, uh, sorry, a million 64-bit um, integers are going to take up about 213 megabytes, which is quite a lot, admittedly, it's quite a lot. Um, but hey, like I said, storage cheap. Um, it is weaker than pure AES or fully homomorphic encryption, um, but it is much better than OPE. Uh, the other big problem, and I'll talk about this in a moment, is actually this scheme is quite difficult to integrate into existing systems because of this whole left-right paradigm. Uh, you, don't, you actually need the left to, to uh, query, you need both to insert, but you actually don't want a database to insert the left ciphertext if you can avoid it. Um, so I'll, I'll talk through that in a moment. So it is a bit difficult. I wanted to share this. This is totally not scientific, by the way. This is just sort of, sort of a hand-wavy approach to, to how secure stuff is. So on, on the, the y-axis here, you've got uh, secure. And on the right axis, on the x-axis, you've got how practical it is. So um, for, and, and practical, put an asterisk there, depends on your application. In, in this context, I'm talking about like database queries. That's the application I'm talking about. Uh, and so traditional AES is actually not very practical for doing database queries. It's incredibly practical for lots and lots of applications, of course. That's why it's the, the advanced encryption standard, um, but not very practical for this. Similarly with new FHE, it's actually not very practical. Um, however, Palier is pretty good, um, can, can, do, can be quite useful in quite a lot of situations. Block ORE, ORE similar, similarly, there's, a, there's a, a, an earlier example of auto revealing encryption uh, which the authors um, cite in their paper, which is also quite useful, but not as secure. Um, and then I wanted to share this example, block ORE, but where we store both the CTL and the CTR, so the left, right, left ciphertext and the right ciphertext. Now, the reason I'm including that there 
is because in the implementation I'm about to show you, I wasn't able to avoid storing the left ciphertext. So it does weaken the security model uh, slightly. But it's still a bit better than OPE. So I wanted to introduce you to uh, PG Secret. Now I'm going to put the microphone down because I can't type and hold the microphone at the same time. Um, but uh, let me give you a demo. So this is a PostgreSQL extension, the database PostgreSQL. Uh, and what I wanted to demonstrate was, um, actually I've got some notes here, I'm just going to bring them up. Oops. Because of stuff. Um, so let's start by creating a, a database. I'm going to create a database uh, let's call it um, sample and PSQL sample. And hopefully I've got all my yeah, I've got my queries here from last night's testing. So what I'm going to do is create a table called people. And then uh, in the table I'm going to start with a name and that's a type text. So I'll leave that in the in plain text just for, for argument's sake, for for example's sake. So I'm going to define two other columns on this database, one called income and one called email, and they're both going to be of type secret. Now secret is a, is a type that I defined in the extension. Uh, however, I need to create the extension first. So um, create extension, that adds it to the database, and then, sorry, I've got to go all the way back up here. So I'm going to create that table, and when I look at that table um, called people, you can see that it's got three columns, name, income, and email, and two of these are of type secret. Now what I might like to do is insert data into that table. I'm just going to copy out some stuff so that I don't have to type lots of stuff. Um, so let's, let's imagine that we wanted to type that. Can you guys all see that? Maybe it's a bit small. So I can't insert plain text into the data. I have to encrypt the data first. Um, so let's say that I wanted to uh, I do wanted to do this insertion. Let me let me blow it right up so you can see. So I'm going to insert name, income, and email. I want to insert the name in plain text. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to use this function called make secret, which takes two keys. Now these are just random keys, but you would normally treat these keys as highly sensitive. And that's going to encrypt the the value. Uh, what is that? 100,000, and then that's going to encrypt the string bobatexample.com. Uh, now. I should point out, you wouldn't normally want to do this encryption in your SQL query. You would actually encrypt it in a client application first and then send the ciphertexts. But just for demonstration purposes, I've made these functions to make it a bit easier for everybody to, to see. So I'm going to copy that code and insert. And then you can see how big these ciphertexts are. So if I go select star from people, it's pretty big. Quite a lot of data there. So that's um, obviously hex encoded. Um, and so the first thing I inserted was um, this income of 100,000. The next one I, incre I insert, let's say that's 200,000. I'll just insert both of these um, like so. And now, if you look at it here, the insertion order was 100,000, 200,000, and 80,000. But I want to order it by income. So what I'm going to do is select name from people order by income, and it's ordered them by income, which is pretty neat. So now I'm doing ordering on, on income. I can also do stuff like this. So select name from people where income more than um, 150,000, say. So I should only get one result. Uh, oh, yes, OK. So I've, I've fallen into my own trap. I can't do a comparison on the integer because I've got to encrypt it first. So I'm going to take this. and actually encrypt the number. And now I can get Alice. Alice is the only one that's encrypted more. So I encrypt, encrypt the query and then send that to the, to the database. Um, the other thing that I can do is, is look up based on email address. So the way that I've implemented strings is that, that strings can be orderable, but because strings can be arbitrary length and they take up a lot of bytes when they're arbitrary length, you end up with extremely long ciphertext. So my approach here is that I've assumed you don't necessarily want to do range queries on strings. Maybe, maybe in practice you do, but I've made that assumption for now. And so what I've done is I've taken a SIP hash of the string to give me a 64-bit integer representation of the string. And now I can do a, a simple lookup rather than a range lookup. So I can do, uh, let's say, uh, what were the examples? Alice at example.com. So there should be two. 
I can go select name from people where, uh, sorry, email equals. And so then I get all the users that had an email address of alice.example.com. So you can see how that works. So in, in terms of um, what's left, um, so we talked about there's two types, integers and string. Integers that are audible, strings are not. Uh, and you need two keys to do it. Do the demo. Um, it currently stores the left ciphertext as well as the right. And that's because of the way that Postgres does indexing. You can't index as you insert. You can only index after you insert. So that's, I don't know how to get around that problem yet. If, if anybody is a Postgres expert and they can help me, I'm very open to some support. Um, but I think even with storing this, the left ciphertext, it's still significant improvement on alternatives. Um, order and group by will always need both anyway. So that's an interesting gotcha. If you want to do an order by query, the ciphertext that you're returning have to be able to compare to each other. So that means you need to, to keep the lefts and rights together. And uh, it's definitely not battle tested yet. And, and maybe as uh, Josh pointed out, there might be some bugs. So I'm very open to some uh, contributors if you'd like to help. Uh, it's available open source. Uh, so github.com slash codadan slash pg secret. And if you want to have a look at the code and have a play and poke holes in it or, or make some suggestions, I'm very, very uh, open to that. And then I've got a few other resources here as well. So new, new cipher, uh, the Palier encryption, that's the Ruby implementation, the original paper, and a website that's sort of talking about the future of homomorphic encryption. So there you go. Hopefully that was interesting. And thanks very much for your time.